Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. First up, he loves to give his brand new Dragon Tribal deck some Earl Grey in the morning so that he can call it Tia Matt. It's Matt Morgan. You know, my, my ex broke up with me. She said I was too obsessed with comic books, but I don't really think I have that many issues. <laughs> That's, um, well, Matt, I'm just glad to see that you're still very animated. Uh, I, I'm surprised you're not marveling a little more at this, <laughs> at this dad joke. I do see what you did there. Oh, right. there you go. <laughs> I can't get this image out of my head. <laughs> anyway, up next, he said that the card white is not a white card. That's Dana Roach. Um, my doctor told me to rub my entire body in salt to fix the condition I had. So um, it worked. Now I'm cured. Um, I have questions, but not ones that I'm going to ask at exactly this moment. Anyway, this is the EDH RecCast. This is the weirdest intro we've had, but let's get into it. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the Commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new Commander decks. And here on the podcast, what we like to do is give all of that data a little more context. Hey, Matt, what is it that we're tackling in this week's episode? This week, we are going to get our shakers out. We're not going to shake it like a Polaroid <laughs> picture, but we're going to bring out the salt shakers this week. Um, we're going to talk about the salt scores. We redid the voting recently, and uh, we've got a lot of numbers to get into. It's it's quite exciting, actually. Yes, we did. We have the community salt poll results. We have so much data to go over and some updated salt scores to dig into. So we'll see what the community has decided are the, quote, saltiest cards in the format. It will be a whole bunch of fun. Real quick, before we get into our main topic, let's pause and give a huge thank you to the folks at the Command Zone podcast, because they handle all the post-production work on our show, making it look as spiffy as it does. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors too. Yeah, the EHREC cast is sponsored by Card Kingdom and TCG Player, my two favorite places to use a little plastic rectangle to uh, purchase little cardboard rectangles. <laughs> Just go to EDH Rec and click on the card in question. Choose the vendor link down below. Doing so supports both the site and the show. And if you'd prefer to support the show directly, you can do so over at patreon.com slash EDH We have patron tiers of all sorts of levels. We have patron exclusive content that we bring out every single month. Um, it's a great time. And if you know you support your favorite podcast while you're at it, so patreon.com slash EDH is where you can do that. And we even have a special tier out over there uh, where we thank somebody just for being a patron, just for supporting us. And we want to definitely appreciate that. So uh, Marwa El Abadi, thank you so much, Marwa, for your support. We definitely appreciate it. That is so awesome. Thank you so, so much. It means the world to us. Okay, definitely. let's get into our main topic now. We are talking about the new salt scores on EDH Rec, which you can visit. You can find it just there in the tabs on EDH Rec. There's a whole page for it to see all of the new stuff. It was rated on a scale of zero to four, where zero is like, this card doesn't bother me at all. And four is like, eh, I'm really not that pleased when I see that in a game of EDH. And right before we even get into what the topics and what the cards were that people voted on, y'all, when we redid these polls, when we reopened them, we got nearly 3.5 million votes in these salt polls. So already we're overwhelmed by how much the community really enjoyed uh, just all of the voting. Matt, did you have a fun time voting yourself on all of these? Because hold it, 3.5 million votes is insane. That That's quite a few votes. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of folks in our Discord, which you can join over at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast. Um, they're sharing their badges. So if you, if you voted mm -hmm. a certain amount of times, um, the site would produce a little badge for you. I know a lot of people are excited about that. Um, I didn't get near as many votes in as I was hoping for, but... Um, I made sure all the chaos cards got a four. I made sure the great packs, basically anything black or blue, it, they all got four. Well, in Basic at, Island, four. Oh, come on. At 3.5 million votes, too, that's statistically speaking, that's like one vote per each new card that came out this year. <laughs> it's like mathematically, oh. that's insane. Oh, dang. Well, it's just, it's crazy to me. So the last time that we discussed the salt scores, we did so on an episode. Um, it was episode 123. We discussed the previous salt score results with CAG member Shivan Bhatt. And on that episode, we talked about the new results. And we had gotten 
six uh, six hundred and fifty thousand votes when we were discussing that data. So we've got five times more data at this point, which I just think is crazy insane. And Matt, while I think that you're a little crazy to say something like "island makes you salty," I do hope that you gave four salt scores to all of the bajuka bogs and rest in pieces of the world because. Oh no 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 no! Yeah, I think you misunderstand me. Those those are zeros. <laughs> uh, those, that's 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 a different ingredient. That's sugar. That's oh, I, that's sweet. I see, I see. And one thing we'd like to make a little bit clear here is just because a card is is very salty on the scale doesn't mean we personally are assigning a value judgment to anyone who plays it. I mean, mm. it may be a perfectly cool card in the pod or play group you play in. Just because mm-hmm. on average people don't love it doesn't mean it's not a perfectly you know cool card to play in a lot of situations. And it doesn't mean we personally dislike it either. We're just relaying data here. Yeah, very I, all, much. all three of our scores probably were very divergent, as you probably already guessed, just about Grave Hate. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, yeah, like all three of us, we we ranked cards probably very differently. We play cards, like all three of us individually, like we probably play cards in the top 100, top 50 even um, of these lists. So it's not like we're saying you shouldn't play these. This is not that type of episode. This is just us reporting back what the community was telling us. Very much. And and actually guaranteed, all three of us are playing cards that show up within the top 50. Like, that is an actual factual thing. And heck, even my, I play Commander with my folks, and my mom plays Grand Arbiter Augustine, who makes all of your stuff cost more. She plays that in her Azorius decks, plural. So, like, this is a thing. Like, these are cards that we totally play. The salt scores are a fun voting thing to do. And we've definitely heard the requests from the community to, to also do, you know, voting stuff like a sugar score, for example. We've got other stuff in the works. Don't worry. But But this is also, you know, this is a tool that was kind of a a fun thing to do in the community. And it's also a tool for new players. For example, when you start playing, you may not know the reputation, for example, that a card like Expropriate has. So that can also be kind of a nifty thing to see on EDHREC. Oh, okay. That quickly clues me into what the community feels about cards like these. I think that's probably enough setup, though, guys. Let's get to talking about some of this data. Dana, take us through it. What are we seeing now on the new and improved 3.5 million votes? What's going on in the top 10 of the new SALT scores? Um, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And <laughs> okay. <laughs> whether we're getting 650,000 votes or 3.5 million votes, People just don't like Stasis or Winter Orb. Um, <laughs> the, the, the number one saltiest card um, last time was Stasis. The number two saltiest card last time was Winter Orb. And that hasn't changed. Those are still the cards that people like to see the least in Commander based on our voting. Yeah, neither of them are really... Uh... I would I, I agree with these scores absolutely they're not really fun cards for me at least in in, in my world uh, but yeah people just don't seem to like it when you mess with their lands it's just something fundamental to the game um, so shutting that down it's uh it's 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 uh, hard for a lot of players to deal with yeah this is the kind of thing that like I think to me assault score kind of clues me in about like these are kind of things that I would want to address in a rule zero conversation because for certain play groups these are totally fine and in fact can be fun to see if you've got the ability to get out from underneath these types of locks that type of gameplay can be very dynamic and very enjoyable but it might not be for a group of strangers when you're just sitting down we've got a limited time to play commander so we want to make sure that we're all actually playing commander and these are cards that can prevent other people from being able to play the game within the hour that you get to. So that is a thing that we're seeing. Dana, I love the way that you put it. Yeah, those scores have not changed. Stasis, still a 3.1. Winter Orb, still a 2.9. So it goes. I mean, if you want to talk about things staying the same, I mean, the next three cards that we see, they've been in the top 10. Um, They're still in the top (laughs) 10. Um, They may have shuffled around a little bit. um, Static Orb, Vornclex, um, the OG, and then Expropriate still sticking around. Expropriate may have been number three last time. It's just number five. It's it's still around, not going anywhere. Um, And Vornclex (laughs) stays at number four as well. So Static Orb does move up a little bit, um, but it's pretty much interchangeable at anywhere in these top tens. Well, now that we've looked at five different cards here, I think we can kind of jump up one level and look at them all holistically. one thing they have in common, and this is probably going to continue for sure as we move down this list, they are cards that tend to prevent you from playing magic, either yeah. by locking out your resources or in the case of Expropriate, um, which I guess can take your resources as well, depending on what mode you choose, but giving your time to somebody else in, in the form of extra turns. Um, mm-hmm. So 
that that's the thing these all seem to do. People just don't like sitting down to play magic and not being allowed to play magic. Wait, Dana, you're saying that you don't like it when I get four extra turns with an expropriate? I don't understand. <laughs> that seems to be a thing people don't... People seem to like doing it because <laughs> it's in a lot of decks, <laughs> but they tend to not like it having it done to them. Very, yeah. Huh? Well, and, and to continue that point, though, Dana, about people don't like it when you know you, you mess with their resources, mess with their lands, um, the rest of the top 10 does exactly that. Um, you have Armageddon, Yokel Hops, Ravages of War, Obliterate and Decree of Annihilation. All five of those cards do essentially the same thing, and they they me they mess with people's lands. Which I mean, it's it's very very hard to play the game of Magic when you don't have any lands. So yeah, it, it's mm -hmm. no wonder why those are showing up in the top ten because they impede with your ability to play the game. Very much. All of those getting a score of 2.5 or higher. And those are also in some decks, again, the type of thing that like you can take advantage of. You can make them asymmetrical. If you play an Armageddon while you've got an Avacyn out, for example, that is basically game over, but they're not always executed that way. And it is also kind of like that, uh, I mean okay, that's a thing that happened. Like, it doesn't always invite the like, oh, that was crazy. I've never seen that before. And I think that, you know, as we talked about on our episode last week, you know, there's a, a dynamism that we are kind of looking for that these cards can, in, in also a lot of cases, like kind of increase the distance between like when the game is actually over and when these cards are cast. And that type of long form, you're taking up the time, that can be a slight bit frustrating, especially when you're in particular not prepared for it. So the commonalities that we're seeing here are of zero percent surprise, but also a good thing to always keep in mind when you're trying to figure out what it is that you want to put into your decks to have fun with the entire table. Yeah, ha having fun is the big thing. If, if you're playing any of these top 10 and, and probably could expand it out even, but like like Joey said, making these part of a rule zero conversation, if this is an integral part of your strategy, it's just kind of a common courtesy thing at this point where um, a lot of folks don't like this as the numbers are showing. So making sure that you're communicating that to people that you may not be familiar with at, before you play a game, it's going to improve everyone's experience all around just by communicating that across. Now, there is a kind of interesting comparison to make against the previous list where we can see that some cards have exited the top 10. So Jin Gataxius, for example, used to be number seven and Cyclonic Rift used to be number eight. And it's kind of curious to see where have they fallen now? Not too far out of the top 10, as it turns out. Cyclonic Rift is now number 13 with a salt score of 2.44 and Jin Gataxius have dropped from uh, seventh place to 17th place, but it still basically has a pretty similar salt score of 2.3. Jin Gataxius Taxis, of course, being that card that robs your opponents of having a hand. It's a really great reanimation target. Holy crap, do I love playing Animate Dead on a Jinka Taxius. It is insane. But when your opponents don't get to have a hand, yeah, that kind of stinks. And Cyclonic Rift, as we all know, is Cyclonic Rift. So it's not too far outside of the top 10 when it is sending all of that stuff back to everyone's hand. It's interesting to see that those cards have fallen, but not too far. Yeah, the, the Rift one is particularly curious, um, given how prevalent it really is in Commander. I think if, if you're looking at the popularity of the cards here, Rift is far and away the most commonly played card in this list. Um, it, it's not like you're seeing it go in less decks than you were you know, a year and a half ago when we first looked at this. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just gotten a little bit less salty over that run, despite the fact that it's just super prevalent. Um, I'm not sure if that means people have adapted to it a little bit. We have gotten a few tools like Teferi's Protection to let you dodge it. Um, so maybe that's made it a little bit less salty or I I'm not really sure. But yeah, that, that one is interesting that the most popular card has just gotten a little less salty. Well, Dana, I actually have a theory about this, and it involves zooming out a little bit more. To be honest, I don't think that the card itself has gotten a little bit less salty so much as there are some other new things that have happened within the format that have just slightly budged it out, but its score is still relatively similar. So it's just more that like among the top 30 uh, most salty cards, for example, there are a few newcomers that have budged things around and made things just mix up a bit, but it is generally the same level of salt for those cards, and there are a few new people in inside of this salty home. Yeah, that, that only dropped five spots. I don't think it's that big of a difference. I think maybe, if anything, people are just kind of admitting that it's not going anywhere. Um, <laughs> sure. I know I was yeah. in the, the denial camp for for a little bit, um, but just, I mean, it got reprinted in, in Double Masters, I want to say. So it's just, mm -hmm. it's out there. People are kind of getting used to it maybe, whereas um, the first few times we've done the salt scores, like it was still kind of a more common topic that people were debating. Um, 
not that it's not unpleasant to, or, or kind of maybe to some people an eye roll. I mean, otherwise it wouldn't be this high on the list, but um, it's still a very popular card. It's still around there and I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. And I think also one thing that Shiva mentioned on the previous Salt episode that we did was that, you know, sometimes it is fun to have a villain to hate in games of Commander yeah. and Cyclonic Rift mm -hmm. kind of being a mascot for that is also kind of interesting at this point that we've all got the mascot of cards that are kind of like, ah, when we see them in games of Commander. But there is also, it's it's fun to have a heel, which I think is the wrestling term of like the person or the card in this case that you sometimes root against. But, you know, again, like I mentioned earlier, we all have cards among this top 30 that are in our own decks because all of us are playing Cyclonic Rift here on this podcast, with the exception of Matt, because he doesn't play blue decks because of reasons, I guess. I, I, I have a blue deck. I have a couple blue decks. <laughs> but yes, they, they do play Cyclonic Rift. Um, it's just that safety valve. Like it's it's one of those cards like it stinks because it's it's so good. It's it's really hard to not include. It's sometimes. so good. It's so good. It really is. And at this point, like the mascotization of it is probably to me, one of the things that make it's fun to hate in that case. I, I kind of enjoy that piece of it. I, I want to circle back just a little bit to uh, the idea of some of the newcomers, because there have been new cards that have come out since the last time we did these lists. Specifically, some of the cards that we're now seeing among the top 30 are Turgrid, God of Fright, and Opposition Agent. Those are new black cards that have entered into the top 30 most salt-inducing cards. Turgrid got a score of 2.24, ranked number 23, and Opposition Agent got a score of 2.15 at rank 28 here. So Turgrid, stealing all of your opponent's stuff whenever they discard or sacrifice stuff, people didn't like seeing that a whole lot, and Opposition Agent taking cards out of your opponent's decks when they try to tutor for something, that one also got a bit of a response from the community. I'm not surprised at all to see Turgid on here. Um, if anything, I'm surprised it's so low. Um, <laughs> Opposition Agent, actually, I'm a little surprised at, however. Um, that card just doesn't seem that salt-inducing to me. I, I, I always kind of feel like if you are tutoring something up and someone is going, someone intervenes and shuts that down with an Opposition Agent, um, that's probably what you deserve to have happen. I, I, I never feel too bad about that a little bit, you know? So that, that one I'm a little bit surprised. I mean, that's just me, but I, I would not have thought that would have surged up into the top 30. I, my personal campaign against Turgrid looks like it fell short because I really wanted that to get into the top 10. Um, I, year, I tried Matt, real hard, I guys. I, I tried real hard. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely, Turgrid should be in the, the, the top I, I I agree. It's it's too low. Um, it's opposition point two four is still a high score. <laughs> it is a high score, but I, I man, if there it could be higher, Joey. Well, we believe. I I would I would definitely put that in in the same tier as Warren Clex, which is the number four card on the sure. on the list. Um, that's just the type of commander I think it is. Um, hopefully the the community catches up a little bit with with that opinion. Um, it, I mean, but we want to talk about one of the biggest risers too, though. Um, Thassa's Oracle jumped up from 36th mm. all the way to 16th on the list. Yeah, that is a pretty big deal when something moves into the top 20 of the saltiest cards. I think it previously had a score of like 2.1 and now it's up to like nearly 2.4. So that is pretty interesting growth to see. Well, uh, one thing to kind of bear in mind here too, but all of this voting, and I'll use a very stark example, um, the Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale is, is number 18 on our list uh, of, of salty cards. Um, looking at data that that is kind of behind the scenes here, about 1,300 people voted um, for that as a salty card. And that's probably more votes than there are actual copies of that card in existence. <laughs> um, literally speaking, like it's probably quite close. So, I mean, just because people vote for something as being salty too, doesn't mean it's a card that's disrupting things at their table. They just read it and realize it's something they don't want to play against and may vote for it. So, you know, a lot of these votes are just based to a degree on perception as well. Just because you don't like this thing and find it salty doesn't even mean it's causing problems at tables. Yeah, I, I think there there's a category of cards that we'll talk about later that I think fall under this. Like, People vote it very, very high, but it's not necessarily something that they even may not have ever, ever played against in a game. So um, it's more they, they dislike the idea of the card than the actual card itself. And I think there's something kind of heartening about that because it does seem in a lot of cases that the community, it's kind of self-correcting in that way. It's just like, hey, these cards aren't very popular. And one of the reasons for that is because as a community, we're all kind of like, yeah, it's not the game that we're really after all the time. Mm -hmm. So like, I kind of enjoy that correlation. Um, Matt, you had just mentioned some stuff about, you know, big jumps and different cards that uh, changed positions in the data. And I want to get into that because there is a very big change here that isn't quite within the top 20 or the top 30 or anything like that. But the card that had the most motion in the salt scores from the previous polls to the 
the ones we've got now. This one fascinates me. I gotta say, I, I did not see this one coming. Dana, I think, will have seen this one coming, though. Dockside Extortionist. Let's talk about Dockside Extortionist. Previously, it had a salt score of 1.15, and now it's got a salt score of 2.0. That is the card with the single greatest amount of movement. It jumped by 0.85, which is big compared to a lot of the motions that we saw previously. It was like, you know, we saw a couple of little changes of like 0.1 or whatever, but that one is nearly a full point in jump. Dana, what are your thoughts about Dockside Extortionist? Because apparently that one is climbing up on people's salt radars. Um, I, my guess here, and this is just personal observation, um, Dockside in the last year or so has gone from being a card you just see people play to a card you see people play and then balance and then flicker and then copy and then clone. Um, so it's it, it's not just a singular value piece anymore. It's a value piece that a whole lot of decks build actually a plan in to abuse as much as possible. So th that is what my guess is that's changed things about Dockside. Well, I think Dockside has gotten more powerful since the last time that we talked about it too. Uh, mm -hmm. Treasures, clues, sure. food, like all these <laughs> different types of artifacts that like feed off of or Dockside feeds off of like those cards are so much more common now. Like treasure is, is in dang near every set at this point now, uh, which Dockside Extortionist only loves to see. So like as much as, you know, other cards get other support, like just the fact that Wizards of the Coast is, is producing just more cards just in general, like the, those are just more cards that are going to feed Dockside Extortionist, make it even better. And I think people are kind of like, okay, it was already very good. Now it's just ridiculous. I think that's really interesting. And while Dockside was the one with the biggest amount of motion, there are a couple of other big movers that are also worth noting here. For example, the card Mind Slicer, which when it dies, everyone discards their hand. That moved up from 0.97 to 1.47, so a jump of 0.5, which is also, you know, not as big a jump as Dockside, but also pretty impressive to see. People don't like discarding their hands in Mind Slicer, especially in conjunction with some commanders like Moldrotha is a pretty repetitive way of <laughs> making everyone discard the hand. So that symmetry people aren't really appreciating. But then also kind of curiously, the Great Henge jumped from 0.6 last time to now up to a 1.26 for a jump up of about 0.6, which again, that seems like a pretty small thing, but that is a growth that is certainly worth noting. The Great Henge is that crazy artifact that gives you mana, gives you life, gives you plus one counters, draws you cards, does your taxes, mows your lawn. That card's insane. And it also seems to be the kind of thing that is slightly creeping up on people's salt radars. Well, and, and to kind of put it in a different perspective, um, yes, 0.6 to 1.26 doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, but when you think about it, like the fact that it's score doubled is, is a good way to put it. Like it went from 0.6 to 1.26. Like that's, that's a hundred percent growth. Like if you talk to any math person, like hundred percent growth in, in what was, it's been a year and a half or so since we last did this. Um, that's pretty insane. Like a 50% jump for mind slicer. Um, when you look at it that way, like those numbers, they, they get a lot bigger as far as, you know, the impact and, and the, the attention that these cards are getting, um, as opposed to just looking at it as just a, a one figure to another figure. Yeah, well put, Matt. I, I don't think these are like noteworthy. It's not like, oh, great henges. Now the salty sling. Like, no, it's the reaction to that is still relatively mild, but it is the kind of thing that we want to keep our eyes on. And Dockside Extortionist in particular, because a lot of people are keeping their eyes on that because it gets ever more popular and, let's face it, ever more expensive. Like, the amount of treasures that it's making in games of EDH these days is also somewhere equivalent to its relative price tag, which is just absolutely crazy. It does a whole lot of work. Those were some of the cards that saw the biggest spikes on the salt score. Dana, are there any cards that caught your interest about stuff that dropped in the salt score? Was there any movement downward? Um, yeah, there's a couple drops here I want to talk about, and, and there are our two biggest droppers. Um, and this was something that came up in a conversation um, offline with some friends here recently. But th but the two biggest drops are Teferi Temporal Arch Archmage and Teferi Master of Time, um, both of which dropped almost half a salt, po salt point. Um, the first Teferi went from 1.55 salt to down to one, and Teferi Master of Time went from 1.84 down to 1.39. So those are half a point drops for both of those cards. Um, I was having a discussion at my shop this week when I was playing with people, and someone made the point that if you put 10 artifacts in a deck, no one calls it an artifact deck. If you put 10 enchantments in a deck, it doesn't become an enchantment deck. But once you put 10 Planeswalkers in a deck, everyone calls it a Super Friends deck. So the thought was during this conversation, 
those are cards people tend to rotate more than something else. If you have a couple Planeswalkers in your deck and a new one comes out you want to try, you just rotate maybe one of your other Planeswalkers out because otherwise you just get to that critical mass where it kind of changes what your deck is. And I'm wondering if that isn't what happened with, with both these Teferis. They were very strong cards that got play in decks, and then when something else came out as a Planeswalker that someone wanted to try, they just rotated their Teferis out, and as a result of people seeing them less and losing games to them less, the salt factor went down. Yeah, and I think on that note too, that's probably why the number three card, as far as the biggest drops, is also seeing a similar drop, uh, Protean Hulk. People just aren't seeing it as much. And I think that might also have a little bit to do with the fact that Flash was banned out of the format um, in the past year. So maybe even if they are seeing Protean Hulk, it's not being used in the way that it was before. And so people are kind of more like, okay, you're not doing this so unfairly. Um, you're, you're having to do a little more, little more work with Protein Hulk, um, and therefore the the numbers are dropping just a little bit now. Yeah, that one was fascinating to me too. Protein Hulk went from 2.02 down to 1.59. What a drop. I feel like those are some pretty substantial staircase down steps right there. I, I think I'm pretty much in agreement with uh, both of you on that one. And I also got to say, another thing that caught my interest was some of the legendary creatures that dropped too. Like, there are some commanders that saw some substantial uh, salt score dips down here too. For example, Olero went from 1.49 down to 1.09. So again, a pretty substantial drop. That guy who just activates from the command zone all of the time, giving you life. That's not the kind of thing that we're like frustrated against as a community very much anymore. Or Derevi, this one was surprising to me. This is this is the, the heart of it for me. Derevi Derevi dropped down from 1.84 to 1.46. That was not a drop I expected. Derevi is still a very powerful stacks commander, and that deck usually contains like those stasises and those winter orbses. Like that one I was a little surprised to see move down because I feel like it's the herald of some salty things in the 99, right? Well, I, I just don't remember the last time I've seen either of those two commanders. I think that might be kind of why folks are, are, are dropping them down. It's, it's hard to be salty about things that you never really play against. Now, granted, Tabernacle, Pendrel Veil, vale, we already talked about that. Um, but as far as commanders go, like I, I don't remember the last time that I've seen an Oloro. Um, you know, the state of of magic design 2021 means Oloro just like doesn't impact the game near as much as any of these commanders that, that are coming out these days. Um, same with Derevi, like there's always gonna be those Derevi stacks decks. Uh, but as far as just people that are kind of playing the typical um, Derevi or Atraxas and other commander in this category that um, dropped a decent amount, I just I don't see a whole lot of them out there anymore. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a combination of, of those two things. I think definitely to a degree overshadowed has has been a thing that's occurred with a couple of these commanders. Um, these were kind of that first wave, particularly Aloro and Atraxa, um, but Drevi too, where there were cards designed for commander, and those were just naturally stronger for the most part than cards that weren't. So they became a bit of a boogeyman. Um, then we hit a wave of commanders designed for commander that were even better than these. Where they, like, they weren't just designed for commander, they were designed to dominate commander. And these just became much less scary when you're looking down the barrel of a loaded chew lane or something. Um, so I think that has helped here. And I also wonder in the case of Derevi, Joey mentioned it's a strong stacks commander and it is, but I wonder if the rise of kind of the pre-game conversation has helped people not blindly walk into that Derevi stacks deck as well. I think if you know it's coming, number one, you're mentally prepped for it. And number two, it just gives you a chance to opt out. And I think maybe getting blindsided by that, that deck generated a lot of salt over the years. And I'm wondering if that isn't maybe just happening less nowadays. I love that, Dana. Yeah, there's evidence here of some design escalation, for sure, in terms of power creep, but also evidence here of rule zero conversation successes. I, I love to see that. Um, and, and on the design escalation point, I decided to take a quick peek at where Golos was sitting, and it's got a salt score of 1.9. Um, it's at spot number 55. So, you know, we are we are still seeing some of that power creep moving on up, uh, going on there with regards to where some of these are at. So that makes a whole bunch of sense. Yeah, Joey, I, I agree. It's kind of been challenging to uh, uh, to see some of the, the new cards, some of the new stuff that's been rising over the years. Uh, makes me kind of want to challenge some other things, um, if you will, uh, because segues need to happen. And this is my segue. That was brilliant. Matt, could you possibly be talking about Challenge the Stats, one of our favorite segments here on the EDH Redcast? It, I, it could be. I'm not, not sure. I won't right. challenge your movement, though. Uh, 
<laughs> it's like the electricity puns all over again. You're a master at it. Anyway, yeah, let's move into that real quick. There's a lot of other stuff that we want to talk about with regards to where the SALT scores are showing us uh, the community's at. But Matt, you're right. It's time that we pause and challenge some stats because it is one of our favorite things to do here on the EDH RecCast because there's so much data, but we don't always agree with it. Sometimes we think that cards see too much play or too little. So Matt, start us off with your challenge this week. What are you challenging in the stats? So this week, um, I have a card that I think it, it's it, not that it's not powerful, but I think it's it's time has come to a close. I think the card uh, Cloud Shift in Rune the Hidden Realm and just in general in Blink decks, uh, just in general, I think Cloud Shift while still potent, um, there are just so many more options that folks have out there anymore. Um, paying the one mana for a one-time flicker of one creature uh, with no other upside, uh, I think it's time to take take Cloud Shift out of your decks and start putting in other cards. Um, it's currently being played in 57% of Blink decks, um, and in Rune in the Hidden Realm, which I want to challenge it specifically, um, it's still seeing play in almost 30%. Um, I just, man... There are so many other better cards. Um, Displace is able to hit two creatures for you, which is another card that you can be playing in this spot. Essence Flux also has one mana, flickers a creature, but it also returns it back if it's a spirit with a plus one, plus one counter on it. So like there's, there's a whole bunch of other flicker cards that have upside, um, whether it's flexibility or other bonuses. Um, Teferi's Time Twist is one of my favorites where you get to exile a permanent you control. And if it's a creature, um, it comes in with that plus one, plus one counter. So you can hit any permanence that people maybe try to blow up. Um, there's just a lot of flexibility out there in this realm for cards that are enabling the flickers to be happening. And I think just Cloud Shift has run its course. Um, I think it's time to start taking that card out of all of your rune decks and flicker decks in general and finding some of these newer cards that have extra flexibility built into them. So um, Teferi's Time Twist is being played in like 10% of flicker decks. I think the number needs to jump up. Well, Matt, you just mentioned some blue cards as replacements, but there's also Ephemerate, which is also one mana and it rebounds itself. And it rebounds. Yeah. Like the, and that card is way down the list. Like I think there's just so many good ones and even stuff. Acrobatic Maneuver is three mana, but it can trips out. It, it replaces itself and draws you a card. Um, so just there's there's a whole bunch of other cards that fill this slot that have extra bonuses built in. And I just think it's time to, to replace Cloud Shift. All right. I also have an overplayed challenge here. So I'm going to jump to mine now. This is our listener submitted challenge where you can submit challenge to stats requests in our Patreon Discord. And this one, Matt, you'll be pleased to know this comes from user the other Matt in our Discord <laughs> who wants to challenge a card that is currently showing up in about 25% of the Wolfgar Commander decks out there. We're talking about Combat Celebrant. This is a very tricky rules interaction that the other Matt was very keen to pick up on here. Wolfgar is the new gruel commander that doubles your attack triggers whenever your stuff attacks. For example, it's got melee, so it'll buff itself up when it attacks, and since it has that doubling up ability, the melee will trigger twice. Combat Celebrant is that Almon Cut card with the exert ability that when it attacks, you can, uh, excuse me, as it attacks, you can exert it, and when you do, then you will get another combat step, but the exert means that it won't untap. The idea here appears to be that you would get two combat things because you would double up the exertion. The problem is that isn't how Combat Celebrant actually works. Combat Celebrant has an as it attacks idea thing going on here, which isn't really a triggered ability. And then when it says, when you do exert this thing, the trigger it's responding to is being exerted, which isn't an attack trigger itself. It's very, very strange, but effectively this means that Combat Celebrant isn't going to give you two combat steps with the doubling of the attack triggers. So the other, Matt, thank you for pointing this one out. This might be a little overplayed in those new Wolfguard decks, and you can find a bunch of other cool creatures with cool combat trick triggers instead to just get a whole bunch of big smashy stuff in there. And to talk to the other other Matt, which is the one here on the podcast <laughs> with me, I'm hoping that you appreciate this nod towards the gruel combat step stuff, which isn't usual for me. I, I do. And I don't appreciate, though, your double negative, but we'll move <laughs> past that. All right. Let's talk to the other, 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 other Dana. What's your challenge? Um, my challenge is not a card called Cranial Plating that's in 5,000 decks. Um, for those who don't know, that's a, that's a two mana piece of equipment that costs one to equip, or you can spend two black to equip it at 
instant speed if you need to. Um, it gives equipped creature plus one plus oh for each artifact you control, and it's in over 5,000 decks. Um, and there's a good reason for that. That's a really good piece of equipment to run in a whole lot of equipment or artifact based decks. Um, you have to have black in that deck, but a lot of them do. So that's a absolute house in a lot of places. What I'm challenging is a very similar card called Hunger of the Nim. It's a sorcery <laughs> that just says target creature gets plus one plus oh till the end of turn for each artifact you control. So it's a sorcery version of Cranial Plating. Um, it's in 41 decks versus 5,000. And yes, it's a one-time effect, but in the right deck, you kind of only need that effect one time and you're going to kill somebody. Um, there's just more than 41 black-based artifact decks out there that can absolutely kill somebody with a two-mana Hunger of the Nim, and it should show up in more than 41 of those lists, especially given the amount of, as Matt mentioned earlier, treasures and food and clues we've gotten in the last year. I'd love, first of all, that, Dana, you found yet another card that none of us have ever heard of for your challenge. It's just, it's quintessential. I absolutely adore it. <laughs> I'm wondering whether we're going to see this very soon in your almost always unblockable Vela artifacts deck in Demir. Um, and I'm also like, have you done some stuff with this with Treasures in particular? Is that why you're, you're challenging? Is there any stories have, to share? Is that what's going on? may have killed a few people with this card in the last couple of days. So that's possible. Mm. I mean, I just want to give you props because I think you broke your own record for the least amount of decks <laughs> yeah, cards played decks, in, yeah. but you're telling people that it should be played more. So um, nice job. Um, and, your, your and name is gone on the wall yet again. Two of those decks are mine. So technically it's in 31, <laughs> 39 decks that belong to other people. Fair. That's incredible. All right, guys, now let's move back into our discussion of the saltiest cards in EDH. And particularly here, I want to pause and analyze something that we haven't analyzed before, specifically the most divisive salty cards. The cards where just as many people voted a zero on the salt score as there were people that voted a four for that card. What are the cards that didn't have the greatest amount of agreement? And are there any trends that we can find out from among those? Dana, what are some standouts from cards that a lot of people voted a four on and a whole bunch of just as many people voted a four uh, as a zero. Like, what are the divisive salty cards out there and what can we learn from it? So there's a cluster of six that share one common trait that we basically have to talk about here. And that is all six of the cards from the Walking Dead secret lair. Ah. Um, you know, Daryl Hunter of Walkers all the way down to Rick Steadfast Leader. Um, all six of those show up on this divisive list. And what's probably most interesting about that, at least to me, is all the previous cards we've talked about were ones that, as I noted, tended to take away kind of your time, whether by giving it to someone else or just keeping you from playing Magic. Um, these are essentially cards people don't like for maybe aesthetics is the best way to describe it. They don't like it for, for flavor or visual or aesthetic reasons, unlike uh, it's almost unrelated to gameplay. It's it, it's a group of cards that are salty to a lot of people for reasons that are unconnected to almost every card before them on the list. That makes a lot of sense. And having played against some of these, the gameplay of them is honestly pretty engaging. Like there is certainly that to it. And I'm never going to begrudge a single person who built one of these because there are folks who definitely resonate with it. But it is certainly the kind of thing that we had to mention here. Matt, are there any other standouts that we should notice there? Because we know what it was with like the way that this particular suite of cards was released. And that has a lot to do with player reception about it. But you know, if they're in a commander game against me, I'm going to have fun playing against you. But what are some other cards that are on the divisive salty list that players weren't quite in agreement on. Well, there, there's another kind of sub theme that we're seeing here too. Um, chaos cards tend to get clustered and, and can be uh, either a four or a zero according to two players. So we see cards like Thieves Auction, Warp World, and Scrambleverse. Those all are having um, a pretty scrambled score, you might say, <laughs> um, ranging anywhere from like a, a 1.96 all the way up to just over two um, on the salt score, but those scores were either, I mean, they were, they were very high or they were very, very low. Um, just because people don't like cards that take, you know, uh, more than an entire turn cycle just to resolve. 
<laughs> that's such a good way. To, <laughs> yeah, just sort of contrasting against what we just talked about, where Dana was like, you know, these were unrelated to the gameplay. Dana, these chaos ones, the the results are definitely related to the gameplay. Some They're people all are about all the gameplay. gameplay. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, yeah, only gameplay. Some, I would say some folks are totally here for the wildness that occurs when you play a warp world, and some folks are just like, I it's my lunch break, man. I can't I can't deal with this right now. <laughs> I, I'm sure cards like Goblin Game would be on this list too. Uh, <laughs> if people had ever fully read Goblin Game or right. fully resolved a Goblin Game even. Um, because I don't know if the, either of those two things have ever happened. Yeah, these are some pretty interesting things to see. And they'll average out to a score of like 1.5 or 1.9 or something like that. But there's a very big difference. And again, I think even though these might not rank super high technically on the salt list, a chaos card is also a pretty good thing to have a rule zero conversation about because, as we can see, those are some things that the community is not quite in harmony about because it's impossible to be in harmony when chaos cards force you to be in, like, you're singing every single note at once. Yeah, you'll never cast that harmonize with some of these in play, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> that was a better joke than the one that I told, so I, I, I love it, Dana. Thank you for that. Barely. It was barely better. <laughs> Uh, there's one other sort of category of cards that were slightly uh, divisive here too, where a bunch of folks uh, voted high on it and a bunch of folks didn't vote high on it. And the only way that I can group these are basically very, 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 very expensive cards. Stuff like Force Field, for instance, which is a reserve list situation. So it is the hundreds of dollars, very difficult to acquire. And even Gaia's Cradle actually appears as a card that a lot of people voted high on and a lot of people voted low on. Like this is a fun, like Gaia's Cradle is a fun card to play against. I feel like it really can produce some very social gameplay. Like it's a bunch of fun to see creature decks, creature decks go off with it. But given its status on the reserve list and especially its near impossibility to acquire, I think that's also playing a huge factor here. Yeah, I, I know a lot of players kind of get the feeling that it's it's a, a pay to win type of card. And like, I get that. And obviously it's a very, very powerful card because Wizards of the Coast has tried doing it two other times um, with Growing Rights of Itlamok and then the, the new elf creature that we just got. Um, so we we get it. Like it's, it's a very, very powerful effect. Um, so yeah, the the... The sense that it's unattainable for a majority of players because it's it's more than my rent payment. It's more than a, a, my car <laughs> payment and my rent payment, actually. Goodness. Um, yeah, it's 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 insane how expensive that is. So, yeah. And Force Field, um, I would make the same joke that Dana did about Tabernacle with, with Force Field. Like, I can't remember. the. I don't think I've ever played or seen played a Force Field. So, uh -huh. um, that one. Well, actually, no. Correction. Don Miner. <laughs> um, the guy who started EDH rec, um, is that much of a hipster that he, he has one, but even then, like it made zero impact on the game. I, I will note this, Matt. Um, I am someone who was lucky enough to get a force field years and years ago and it was cheap. And I haven't seen that force field in several years. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you might want to find it then first. This is my <laughs> yeah, first suggestion. Seriously. It's probably around here somewhere. Oh, goodness. There's one other thing that I'm going to uh, point out here, too. Uh, when we were looking at, you know, sorting this, going by standard deviation to see what are the cards that were the big differences and how people voted on it. There's one other thing that I have to point out here that warms my heart so much to see that the card Salt Road Quartermasters was also a very divisive card where a lot of people voted very high on it and a lot of people voted completely zero on it because it has salt in the name. So it therefore must be a very salty card. The community, I'm so proud of you guys. That makes me very happy to see. That, must must the, be salty. That's the Bodie McBoat face of the <laughs> salt score <laughs> system we have salty right here. Salty McSalt face. Oh, that's so brilliant. Uh, yeah, that just that's that's wonderful. Wonderful to see. So those were some examples of uh, cards that don't have a ton of agreement on. So again, rule zero conversations, that can be a great thing to talk about before the game starts, especially those chaos things, because if you resolve a warp world against Matt before he knows that it's like that's not established. If I try to resolve a warp world against Matt in, in one of our games, um, he's going to give me a you'll, you'll have I, a concession before you'll have that card resolve. I, I, I can, I can tell you a, that a withering glare he'll give me. Um, but here's a different topic that I want to move to now, guys. Are there cards that you expected to see a lot higher in the salt score list? Things that didn't show up in the top 50, top 30 or anything like that, but you just expected to get a, a much bigger score based upon, you know, community reception or community conversations that you've seen or your own personal feelings about those cards. What are some stuff that you expected to see higher? 
Um, if, if you're talking community reception based on it after it was revealed, Jeweled Lotus should have been in the top five. Oh. Um, there was a lot of angst about that card when it first got spoiled. And I was a little bit shocked they, they made it um, at the time. But I think it was also one of those things that it was relatively apparent right away it wasn't going to... I mean, there, there was a cap to how effective that card was going to be. And at least the community reaction at the time compared to the community reaction for people that were voting on it, there's a pretty wide discrepancy there because, yeah, it didn't crack the top 100 even. Well, and, and to build off of that, like I tweeted about Jeweled Lotus recently and just said, like, I don't understand why people want this to be banned. And a lot of the responses that I got were people said, well, it's indicative of all, all the fast mana in the format. Um, well, if you look at all the kind of the signpost card for fast mana and mana crypt, um, that card's 99 overall. Um, it has 1.6 salt score, which is like, it's a respectable score, but like with as many responses as I got, yes, it's this is anecdotal. This is just my own experience. Um, but people saying, well, it's, it's all about the fast mana. Like, well, the, the fast mana cards aren't even showing up that high on the list. Yeah, the Jeweled Lotus is a really good shout because uh, honestly, that is the kind of card that I've also seen like enable the use of like nine mana commanders and that's something i honestly do love to see like this makes those very very expensive like or or something that's seven like a Vishkal, for example which is a commander that it always catches my eye because it's very interesting but it's seven mana and that's so much that i'd have to like the second time i cast it is nine mana like ugh, that's a lot but i do personally like that jeweled lotus can also be used completely fairly to just help the crazy high expensive commanders be more usable in the first place and that's something that i honestly do kind of appreciate about it so i don't kind of like dockside extortionist honestly i don't have that much uh dislike in my heart for either of those two cards or their designs because i'm just like yeah this is doing some of the big stuff and it can cause some crazy things to happen which is kind of what i'm here for in the first place well another one kind of jumping out here is torment of hailfire 79th um i i was actually expecting that one to be a little bit higher too just because kind of the default reaction I, I hear from that card, you know, just in the background, whenever someone's like, oh, who won that game? And someone will say a name. Oh, how'd they win? Torment to Hellfire. And all you'll hear is, oh. <laughs> like, you know, and I guess that isn't necessarily a salty reaction. It's just one where, like, you can hear the sound of people's eyes rolling. Um, so I, wow. I thought it might be a little bit higher. But 79th, um, you know, it's a salty card, but it's not nearly as as – rage generating as some of the truly salt inducing ones in the list well do you remember when we last discussed the salt scores with shivan but torment to hailfire was a really big one for him he was just sure, like this yeah. card should be higher because his argument was that it still gives people hope sure and right that's not good. fair it's a real good <laughs> to point to give them yeah. hope when when it's there should there really is no hope but like yeah torment of hailfire i i get it it also can be like oh you know so but also games gotta end like that's another one of those cards where i'm just mm -hmm. I, I can't summon an ill will against it necessarily i'm way more gonna be like i'm gonna not seethe i guess but like i might clench my jaw a little bit if i see some of the cards that are just a bit more trolly and advancing your own game plan in the way that torment does isn't necessarily like gonna annoy me as much as like I don't know, this card is banned, obviously, but the gameplay of Iona, Shield of Ameria, which just shut down one person's ability to do a lot of stuff, that felt like just, that feels a lot more egregious in a social game than Torment of Failfire ending everything. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Joey. I would say cards that sometimes just end the game, um, even if people don't love them, they maybe don't have enough of a reaction to give them a high salt rating. That's probably mm -hmm. what is situational with Torment here. I, well, and one card that I'm kind of surprised just because of the the massive reaction that it got when Modern Horizons 2 preview season was going on was Void Mirror. Like I was oh, for yeah. sure everybody was going to have that as a four. Um, but it turns out um, it's only number 372 on the list, barely cracking a salt score of one. Um, yeah. I, it just seems a lot of people either forgot about it or that turns out like it helped them more than it hurt them like they thought it was going to be. So um, I'm personally glad to see, you know, the, the Void Mirror score is a little more reasonable than I think the community reaction during preview season was. I think yeah. I think once the secret got out that it folded to basic plane, I think that was kind of the end. Of <laughs> I think I heard somebody say that on a podcast. The, of the, the Void Mirror hate. <laughs> There, there is something to that, though, of like, you know, the immediate reaction compared to like when things have cooled and when we can come back to a little bit later, like that does in some ways feed into uh, the reactions that we might have at this time. So it is nice to get a little bit of distance from the immediate reaction to really be able to reevaluate it. And that also <laughs> kind of... 
Oh, what's that giggle for, Matt? What do you? What, what's that giggle? I was about? just thinking you can't spell knee jerk reaction without jerk. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> savage. But, I mean, I that's me just being sassy. So I love it. I'm I'm here for that. That's that's wonderful. Um, it it does kind of make me want to transition into another question for you guys. And basically, I'm curious what you think about the intersection of the price and popularity situation with regards to salt. Because when we were going through all of this data, Andy from Architect, one of the programmers who helped us with this whole salt poll in the first place, and Architect is a great deck building website you should totally check out. He noticed something very, very interesting with regards to the data with the higher more expensive cards, such as dual lands, for example. Dual lands, on average, got about 0.5 more points on the salt score than literally any other color fixing or even utility land out there. And then we've also seen cards like Smothering Tithe and Ristic Study creeped up just a little bit in the salt score and Cyclonic Rift, of course. And there's something about their effects, but also just their sheer popularity. Basically, I just want to see what you guys think about how popularity and price might play a factor here with regards to our voting or whether the community self-corrects or I don't know. Dana, I'm going to pass it to you. Do you have thoughts about price, popularity, salt, sugar, whatever it is? I, I for sure do, particularly in terms of dual lands, which I would say most of the time aren't even that impactful in mm. most decks, particularly two and three color ones. Um, you know, seven-ish years ago or so when a Badlands or something was roughly the price of what a Smothering Tithe is today, the reaction <laughs> I got when I had one in a deck was someone saying, oh, oh, that, that's a card, or oh, neat, an old duel. Um, today, when people see them with the price they're at today, the reaction is much more, oh, so that's the power level we're playing at? Um, really? People okay. are much more, at least strangers, my friends maybe who are used to seeing those things aren't, but like people who aren't used to seeing them, newer players, they have a much more like cautious reaction and assume your deck is probably filled with old, preserve less expensive cards that are that are mm. actually powerful. So I, I've definitely noticed a change to the point where when I do a pregame conversation discussing a deck's power level, I tend to tell people if there's a dual end in the deck, just like, hey, this is, you know, only a six-ish power, but I do have an original dual in here. So you know, if that comes up, be forewarned. All right. Yeah, I think that's kind of why the Great Henge, its score went up because it, its price mm. has not gotten cheap. But like, it's also kind of weird, you know, we're talking about all these cards that it's very, very expensive and it's kind of polarizing, but then Mox Diamond is number 344 on the list. Like it's it's got a <laughs> 1.07 salt score. And that card is like, what I'm doing advanced filters on, you know, any given deck or commander. Uh, if I just want to look at a, kind of the more casual focused decks, like that's a card that I just will go to advanced filters and exclude because it's kind of a signpost card for the direction of a deck. Um, mm. So it's kind of interesting to me that um, that's a card that's so low, but it's gotten extremely expensive and it's a very, very popular card in some circles, but the salt scores had it fairly low when other kind of signpost cards for the more kind of the more tuned decks, the more powerful decks, um, those are showing up higher than Mox Diamond. I, I mean, I wouldn't even call it a song signpost card. Um, I would call it the signpost card for competitive EDH. Like that's the one card I, I think you do see some overlap where there are cards that are very common in competitive that you know work their way into non-competitive um, decks. Mox Diamond just doesn't. You just that, that's like, that's the one card that you see with the probably highest penetration in CEDH decks that you just never see with that environment. So like that's the card I, I would say. If you're playing CEDH, it's not salt worthy because that's what you're expecting and you don't see it otherwise. So maybe it doesn't have a reaction then either. Right. There's so much of that here where like it's interesting to have those different signpost cards here. I, I think for me, going back to that idea of like popularity effect, you know, how I feel about a card, does price of a card affect how I feel about it? Like the, Dana, as you mentioned, the dual lands. How much do they impact the success of a deck in gameplay? It's a pretty slim percentage on how much it's really going to boost you up. And playing within your budget is perfectly fine. Use a snow dual land. I know they come in tapped, but you can't beat something that costs a quarter. Like, those are just important things, too, to note about. Like, the self-contained stuff that's happening within a game feels really, really important to me. And I'm just going to be way less happy about a very cheap winter orb than I am about, like, the fact that you happen to have owned a taiga. I, I completely yeah. agree. Yeah, absolutely. Like in, in the case of dual lands, especially just price does not always equal power. 
Right. Like they're nice, but it's it's purely a luxury item for a, it, but it's not going to increase your win percentage at all. Yeah, very much. So with all of this that we've gone over, there have been a handful of interesting changes, a couple of new cards like Turgrid that we saw jump into some of the top spots and a bunch of cards that have dropped down a little bit. I kind of want to round us out in the show talking about all of this salt and also just kind of remind that like, again, this has been interesting to look at, but the salt voting was all just like it's a fun thing to do for the, like as the community and to like kind of see here are some cards that are worth rule zero conversations. Here are some things that are interesting about the way that we all play EDH and how we all engage with it. But there's one also final lesson that I feel like I just got to hammer home here is that it's also never about individual cards. Like no individual counter spell is particularly salty at all. Like counter spell is fine. It shows up in hundreds of thousands of decks. But like a deck that contains 60 counter spells, that's a different story, <laughs> you know, like there's no combo that's a problem, but 15 tutors to go and find a combo, that's a different story. So like there is also something that's kind of missing from all of the salt information that we've got here because strategy also plays a huge role in that nature of that discussion. Yeah, um, I think this isn't really about any specific card being salty. It's just kind of to give you a high level view of what kind of concepts, maybe more than cards, people tend to not like, and just apply that to your pregame conversation if those concepts pop up frequently in your decks. It's just something to keep an eye on to kind of direct you towards what things you might want to warn people about. Yeah, it's just kind of categories that you see, and that's kind of what we wanted to do this episode about, just to kind of give people some more insight on Yes, here are the raw numbers, but also like, well, what are some things that we can take from it? Um, mass land destruction, something not very popular, something that's going to induce a little more salt than your your land war elves, your your mana dork type of deck. So just things to keep an eye on as you're going throughout and, and you know having those pregame conversations, having that deck building process too. Um, yeah. Is this and thinking to yourself, well, this is like a pretty salty card. Like, is this something that I want to put into my decks? And just giving your you know giving you some some help in that process to make your decks more sociable, since this is. A social format. Right. Like when we play a game of Commander, Matt, something that I think you said on our last episode was you want to build decks that other people, uh, excuse me, no, you want to build decks that you would have fun losing to. Like that is a, a really enjoyable thing where you get to play those crazy stuff. And the cards that we've discussed in this episode, it's also totally possible for people to enjoy losing against these cards. It just may require a bit more commitment from the entire table. And, you know, when you're playing with strangers or you've got a limited amount of time to play games, that is a thing to note. But like all of these just come back to the fact that, as you said, it's a social format. And it's I, I just still can't get that quote out of my head of like playing stuff that you would enjoy losing to because that is it's so much fun to be able to remember to take away something from the game and and to kind of get that like I just I love that positivity and I think that even among all of these lessons there's still so much positivity positivity to be found with the way that the community is engaging with all of this stuff in the first place you, you know I've, I've never claimed to be a smart person but I can drop a wise nugget every now and then so I'm glad that you took that from last week's show <laughs> It was it was just a, a, a really, really good time, I think. Um, unless we've got any other final salty thoughts, should we call this episode to a close, do you think, guys? Or do we think that everyone's wrong and really the most salty card in the entire format should be the card Salt Crusted Step? Uh, in considering that, Joey, I would say nah, CL. N-A-C-L. Uh, <laughs> the old knackle. Well done, Dana. That was that was uh, once again. You're better at these jokes than I am, so that's awesome. <laughs> Bear, right. the, the the bar is not that high, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and thank you. Anyway, guys, I, I, I think for Joey's dignity, we need to uh, roll this one out. Yes, yes. I'm I'm trying to call this episode to a close. So, if our listeners would like to get in touch with us, where is it that they can find us all, Matt? So you can find me on the Twitters at Mathemus55, that's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And if you want to catch us playing with some of these salty cards, twitch.tv slash EDH RecCast is where you can see that. Uh, every Wednesday evening, we have some guests on who probably play more salty cards than we do, but that's fine because they're our guests and uh, we let them do pretty much whatever they want. And we rule zero the crap out of it because it is so much fun and it's really cool to see. Anyway, what about you, Dana? You can find me on the Twitter birds at Dana Roach. You can hear me on my other podcast, CMDR Central. I'm writing articles for EDH Rec and for Commander's Herald. And you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDH
And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter, and you can find the cast at EDHRECcast on both Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, if you've got a question for us, you can contact us at EDHRECcast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to the whole team at the Command Zone for handling the post-production work on the podcast, and we want to thank our sponsors, TCG Player and CardKingdom.com, and you can visit altersleeves.com slash EDHRECcast for cool, custom EDHREC sleeves. Listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights, but until then, remember, EDHREC your deck before you wreck your deck.